This is our second webinar, um, Strategies for Success. We're going to talk a bit about prizes today, which will be very exciting. Um, just as a housekeeping note, this webinar is being recorded. So um, once the webinar is finished, it's uploaded, we'll get it added to the nonprofit toolkit for you so that you can check back on slides um, and revisit any sections that you found valuable. Um, so welcome. Uh, my name is Sarah. I am um, with Mighty Cause. Uh, and we are just super excited to be partnering again with you all um, for the 2023 event. So I'll pass it over to you, Mara, and you can say hello. Hello, and thank everybody for attending today's webinar. Sarah says we have record registration. Let's hope that equals uh, attendance uh, so that you can earn a prize early on. We have 67 people signed up. And I also want to thank you for all of the work you have already done on your Richland Gives page and the campaign. Awesome. Um, so a quick look at our agenda today. We have a lot of new content. We're going to talk a bit about donor um, engagement, how to engage your supporters, how to engage your board. Um, and then I know you all are very excitingly awaiting the 2023 prizes. So Mara is going to cover that. And then we'll talk, um, as we always do, about resources and support, just to make sure you have everything available to you as you prepare for this year's event. Um, and then if you have any questions as we move along, you can send them over to us. Um, and then, of course, we'll also have time at the end. So if you think of something or you want to talk through anything, we can do that as well. Um, but to get started, I'm going to pass it back to you, Mara, and you can cover the 2023 prizes. Thank you, Sarah. You know, we know from national data that people who are philanthropic give to six or seven organizations every year. And during Richland Gives, we see the same thing. Last year during Richland Gives, we raised over $507,000 from 2,600 donations, and that represented about 1,800 individuals. So when you ask someone to give during Richland Gives, they go to the website, they look you up, and then they give, but then they start looking at other pages and they donate to those organizations as well. So your ask can potentially help five or six other nonprofits. And a successful Richland Gives is going to take our collective work and excitement. So some people who are new to fundraising are embarrassed, are scared to ask people for money. But what you are really doing as fundraisers is giving people an opportunity to invest in your mission. And thanks to the donors at the Richland County Foundation, this year we are offering $80,000 in grant prize incentives. And you'll see some of those uh, different categories on the screen right now. Last year, we decided to go to uh, three areas of grant, of grant prizes uh, to make the playing field a little bit more fair for the nonprofits. So you'll see the small, medium, and large nonprofits. And that is based on the operating budget that you submitted during your registration form, on your registration form. So please make sure that you answered that question correctly uh, because when we start the leaderboard on November 28th, you will be placed into the category that you answered on the registration form. So if along the way, um, I would say by the end of October, if you're second guessing yourself on that, let me know because Mighty Cause starts building the leaderboard and it's very difficult for them to change your category once that leaderboard is built. So let's take a look at all the individual prizes that you can start um, strategizing for. We have the leaderboard prizes, uh, which are the highest category of prizes at the $5,000 level for first place. And you see the other places there. So say during the campaign, and at the end, you qualified for two of these leaderboards, like you qualified third place for most donors and first place for most dollars. So we will award you one leaderboard prize at the highest possible dollar amount. 
golden tickets. These are started on the day of Giving Tuesday, which is November 28th. But something that I want to make clear right off the bat for people new to Richland Gives, the giving period starts November 13th at 7 a.m. in the morning, and then it concludes on November 28th at 7 p.m. So if you were stacking donors at the beginning uh, to earn one of the early giving prizes, please make sure they give after 7 a.m. on November 13th. All of these donations are tracked via credit card uh, transactions. And so if your donors decide to get up really early and give early, uh, it doesn't actually help towards these grant prize incentives, but you will receive that donation. So you see how uh, the golden tickets break out for the day of November 28th. And uh, so you can strategize for those hours uh, for your size of nonprofit. Um, yes, and I'm gonna just mention, since we're talking about strategy, um, just as Mara said, um, these golden tickets are a really great op opportunity for you to start to kind of pick and choose different time periods that you want to really, really encourage your donors to give. So if you're looking at all the prizes and maybe you're not sure you're going to get a leaderboard prize, um, but there are some very large, you know, golden ticket prizes available. So these are really great opportunities for you to start to kind of create that timeline of what prizes you're really going to try to aim to reach. Um, during the event. And then you can start to kind of create a communications plan geared around those specific prizes. So if you're trying to win, you know, one of the all MPOs golden tickets um, for, you know, most unique donors or most dollars, um, that can be built into, you know, an email blast that you send donors, letting them know, you know, this is a, the prime time to give for us. Maybe you also want to have um, start thinking about like where you can plug in matches. Um, that's a good way to work with golden ticket strategy is figuring out, okay, we can get a donor um, or a grantor um, or even your board to come together and give a large, you know, match that we can leverage during our power hour or our, you know, large golden ticket opportunity um, where we can really try to amp up donation count amp up dollar count and aim to win one of those larger, you know, golden ticket prizes, because these are some good amounts to win. And then uh, we had a question that in the chat, what is a unique donor? A unique donor is attached to an email address and their first and last name. And Sarah, do you have anything else to add about a unique donor? Yeah, unique donors, um, just like you said, um, email address, uh, but just keep in mind, these need to be um, donations that are made by the donor. Um, so just keeping that in mind, um, donors can be unique during different hours as well. So don't feel like if a donor gave during the day and you didn't win one prize that they can't give during another part of the day. Okay. The matching grant prizes, we started this a couple years ago, and Sarah will go into other details uh, about how to accomplish, you know, a strategy for this. But basically, we are offering one prize per nonprofit category size, and that will be done by a random drawing. So each small nonprofit that meets 100% of a $1,000 or higher matching grant will be entered into a random pool prize for that grant prize. Um, I will say that the matching grant is a great way to challenge your donors and also to challenge uh, your donors not only to offer the matching grant and also to challenge other donors to meet that uh, challenge. So if you're looking, uh, who can I ask a matching grant prize of? You could ask your board members to put up a matching grant prize. You can ask uh, various companies and corporations in the county uh, that are familiar with your nonprofit to offer a matching grant. Mm -hmm. Yep, matching grant prizes. Um, I really love these prizes because just like you were saying, it really challenges um, you as a nonprofit. If you've never dabbled in matching grants, it's a good way to try to make a matching grant. 
um, work with your board to create the match. So um, I have some slides later kind of talking about board involvement, but matching grants are a great way to get your board involved. Um, sometimes boards aren't totally sure how they can help during the giving event and asking your board to try to work together, um, network, you know, within their own kind of circles and see if they can, you know, work together to find somebody, a company, a small business, um, or even just, you know, their workplace, friends, people to come together to offer a gift um, that you can use and leverage as a match during the event. Um, so these don't have to be like one one gift from one grantor. You can have multiple people come together to create the grant um, that you use. So you could, if you have a board, for instance, um, if you have you know ten different people on the board and they all want to donate a hundred dollars, there you go. You have you know what you need to create your match for this year. Um, and these are also really great talking points. So matching grants don't only just work to bring in more donors, work to bring in more dollars, kind of get the party started, get everybody excited, there's a match. Um, it also is a really great talking point um, on socials, in your emails, if you're looking for ways to kind of push the momentum of the day, a matching grants is a really great way to do that. You can talk about if your donor, if your grantor wants to be public, this is a great way for them to get more visibility, to show off their philanthropy, um, and just have more speaking points throughout the day, why people should give now, well, we have a match. Um, and then you can also use your match kind of to track your progress. So you can say, well, we have 50, you know, 50%, half of our match left. We have four hours left in Richling Gives. Um, donate between now and then to try to, you know, get as much as we can out of this match. And another thing about matching grant funds, uh, we have donor advised funds at the foundation. And Allie, my coworker, uh, let me know through the chat that uh, the donor advisors have been made aware of the matching grants opportunity during Richland Gives, as well as Richland Gives. So say somebody, you have a relationship with one of the donor advisors of a fund here, uh, you could talk to them about supporting you during Richland Gives. And if they agree to do that, have them contact us so we can make that happen. And I see there's another question in the Q&A. It says, what is the best way to capture a matching grant from multiple donors within a fundraiser? So I would give that example again that uh, Sarah just gave. So if it's collectively your board, uh, that's one good way to get donors, many donors involved in a matching grant. You could give that matching grant a special name and you could have multiple people give to that as one matching grant. Mm -hmm. You would set it up just as one sole grant um, and then they could each make their gifts uh, after the match is met, um, they could each, you know, submit their $100 gift online or they could submit it offline, depending on how you've decided how to settle up after the match is met. So there are two early giving prizes, uh, the first 10 to raise $10,000 via 10 donors and why we have so many people at the webinar today. There's a chance for you to win a $500 prize just for attending today's webinar. So that, that first prize typically goes pretty quickly. So when you're doing your strategy on that, uh, you know, it's best to line up your donors early and then ask them to give starting at 7 a.m. on November 13th in order to be, uh, to be awarded that prize. Peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers, I feel like this is a place where all of us could grow our Richland Gives pages. What that is, is on your homepage, you have a donate button and you have a fundraise button. So you can ask volunteers, people close to your organization uh, to fundraise on your behalf. 
So if they click that fundraise button, they will set up their own page asking people to give to your nonprofit. And what this does is this mushrooms out your contacts and also your potential donors to your nonprofit. You're having other people market on your behalf. So I think this is a really strong tool and uh, I feel it's a good way to grow your campaign. Yeah, um, and I'm really excited for this prize this year as well because um, our goal is to get more people peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Sometimes peer-to-peer -peer fundraising can feel like a heavy lift. It can be intimidating to some people, um, but they only need to raise $250 to be eligible for, eligible for this prize. Um, and for anybody who meets the $250 gets entered into a random poll um, where their total is going to be matched. That winner that gets drawn will be matched by up to $1,000. So this is a really great way to incentivize anybody to try out peer-to-peer -peer fundraising um, this year. So if you have family, if you have friends, if you want to put out a, a call on social media and say, click link in bio to create easily create your own peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser for us this year, just by raising $250, we could be, you know, your 250 could be matched. Um, so that's a really great way to try to build a strategy, incentivize people. Um, Mighty Cause, uh, as the platform, you know, provider, we create it really easy for them to be able to just click fundraise on your organization profile. They click that button next to donate fundraise. It prompts them to go through and create kind of a landing page they can uh you as the nonprofit can make it even easier for them by creating a template and you can do that through your own campaign section um your fundraising tools campaign area um but you can pre-fill text you can pre-fill the mission statement you can pre-fill you know uh your logo or you know a, a goal bar, how much you hope each person will raise, and then that peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser can then go in and make any edits. Maybe they feel the goal is too high, maybe they feel it's not high enough, they can adjust from there, um, but it does make it even easier for them to try and set up a page. And last year, we only had a handful of peer-to-peer, -peer, true peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers. By that, I mean set up by somebody that is a friend, or a family member or a volunteer, not the nonprofit setting up a peer to peer, which you're welcome to do that, but that page would not be eligible for this specific prize. Um, but last year's winner was a volunteer at the Mansfield Playhouse. So she, by her peer to peer fundraising, she won more money uh, for the Playhouse. Yeah, and I'll just also specify not the nonprofit needs no admins of the organization. So it needs to be somebody who's not operating your nonprofit, not operating your organization page. So leaderboard watch prizes. Um, we have always done these random pool prizes during the party. And so if you your nonprofit will get one ticket in the bucket if you raised at least $2,000 between November 13th and November 27th, which is the day before uh, the culmination of Richland Gives. So we'll put those names into a bucket and pull out nine random prizes and you can win $250. Last year, we started this best page award and this is judged by employees of Mighty Cause and we had just one prize last year we just had the best page award and uh so this year i felt that since you put so much work into doing your page and working on your page that we should offer three prizes in this category in order to be um, considered for this prize you must submit a form by november 6th and Sarah will push that out via messages on your Richland Gives dashboard. So that form will, well, will that form be available on the toolkit, Sarah? Yes, it's already, um, I think, actually, let me check after, I'll see. I believe I put it there. It's okay. also on the prizes page and I'm going to create a brand announcement. Okay. So when you log in, you'll see a quick uh, link that you can just click to, uh, to add your page. Okay, so the form will be available in several places, 
and please submit that form, which is just basically the name of your nonprofit, your name, a couple questions, uh, by November 6th at 5 p.m. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say. Last year, we did a poster contest, and I felt like I was just giving you uh, busy work at school, like fill out this worksheet. And that's another reason we are not doing the poster prize this year. But this is also why I expanded the best page award to first, second, and third place. Um, the best page award, actually, I would say is a whole strategy in itself, just because these are some wonderful prize amounts to win. Um, so I have a whole slide kind of digging in a little bit more about what we are looking for um, as we start to review your pages. Um, so as Mara said, there's a first, second, and third place this year, which is very exciting. Um, and what we're doing is we're reviewing your organization pages that you've put together, you've worked so hard on, you've added, you know, your text, your photos, your mission statements, any videos. We're really looking for how you tell your stories um, to a donor who is visiting your page. So our team is visiting the page links that you submit, and we're looking at them kind of with fresh eyes and just seeing like, if I was a donor and I was coming to this page, am I getting all the information I need to, to make my gift? Um, are you telling us who you are? Are you clearly communicating like what you do at your organization? Um, and also a big, big thing that donors are looking for when they come to your page is trying to understand what their gift is going to do for you. So trying to make that connection, um, we look at your checkouts, we look to see, did they fill out, you know, suggested amounts? What does $10 do for their organization? Does it, you know, buy medicine for, you know, a week or something like that. Like, are we able to clearly understand as a donor visiting what my dollars are going to, how they're going to impact this organization? So we're looking at kind of a couple different key areas. We wanna make sure you have a thank you note um, filled out so you can add like a thank you message to the receipt. You can add a thank you message. Um, once that donor clicks donate, it pops up on the screen. So we like to make sure that you have a message of some sort, photos are really good. Um, people love to see pictures, so the more pictures you have, um, pictures often can tell a story all by themselves, so we aren't looking for super text heavy pages. A donor who is coming to your page wants to kind of get the idea without having to read, you know, a novel, so you want to highlight your mission highlight what you're fundraising for specifically. Are you fundraising for something very specific for your, you know, improvements to your building? Or are you fundraising for, you know, a certain part of your mission? Um, what is it that you're trying to accomplish with this year's Richland Gives? And then how are you clearly communicating that throughout your donate form? Uh, just in a couple, all the different areas of your page. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say uh, there are tutorials on the Richland Gives uh, resource tab on how to create the best page. Yes, um, and you'll just want to make sure you get it all uh, filled out and submitted by uh, November 6th. And uh, you can honestly, you can submit now and you can keep working on your page so that you don't forget later because I know November 6th might feel like far away. Um, but we'll close that form right at exactly after 5 p.m. on the 6th. Um, all right, so those are all the prizes. We're very excited for this year. Um, the next segment, we're going to talk a bit more about strategies for success as far as um, kind of the psychology of giving, how to accurately tell your story, who is your donor, who are you talking to. We want to talk a little bit about tending to your supporters that you already have, making sure that they are you know, thanked um, and supported throughout your campaign as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about retention plans, sponsorships, partnerships, um, recurring giving and how important that can be, uh, and then also board involvement. So hopefully we can get through all of it. Um, so to start with a little bit about psychology of giving and how to tell your story. So we all know that giving is just a very emotional experience for a donor and they are giving to your cause because they care. So nobody obviously has to donate to a nonprofit, but they are doing so because something you're doing is very valuable to them. So you want to think about your message. Um, think about what you're doing and how it's going to impact the community, the donor. Do they live in that area? 
most likely they do for Richland Gives. So what are you doing to help them, to help you know, elevate their life or the life of those around them? Um, so you wanna really speak to what's in it for them when you talk about what you do and why you do it. Um, what will they get out of donating to your cause? So like we said, giving is an emotional experience. The best way to connect with donors and to encourage them to give is by, you know, pulling at things that are valuable and important to them. So what are they getting by donating to your cause? How is it impacting you, thereby impacting them? Um, like it says below, making the connection between their gift and the impact. What does it do? How does it impact not just your organization, but them? Does it, you know, impact their children? Does it impact their, you know, grandparents? Does it impact, you know, people who are less fortunate in the community? Um, understanding your donor and really thinking about who your current donor is is also going to help drive uh, your kind of kind of steer how you are trying to find new supporters. So if you think about all of the donors who are giving to your organization right now, you probably know a good portion of them individually as well. But who are they? Are they, you know, a certain age? Are they a certain demographic? You can get a lot of information from your donors by just looking at who your current list is and then trying to figure out where those donors exist in the community elsewhere. Like, how are you going to continue to get new donors? So thinking about how to reach new donors, once you have kind of your donor profile kind of set up, you know who they are, maybe they're a certain age group, maybe they care about certain causes, um, you can then start to create email lists, you can start to look at the email lists you already have, um, you can start to maybe come up with, you know, volunteer opportunities. A lot of the times people might donate to you, but oftentimes you'll start getting more donors by having more opportunities for people to learn about your cause and get more involved. In some ways, this is more, well, in most ways, this is a more you know, of a year round type of structure, like you'll want to have volunteer opportunities if possible, you want to, you know, talk to people at different events to try to like build that donor base. But if you're thinking about right now in the short term, going to schools now that schools are back um, up, uh, some schools encourage um, like community service before graduation, you can have flyers, you can start to like create more community and donor relations um, to try to reach more people. I mean, we all want to try to reach more donors and sometimes that can be challenging. Social media obviously is a big one, but it's gonna take work. Um, Another great opportunity is to see if there's other nonprofits involved in Richland Gives. Maybe they, you know, work in tandem with you or they, you know, can support you in some way, whether that's however that looks. Maybe you are part of what mission that they do and then they do part of a mission that you do. You can kind of start to think about other connections and overlap with mission for other organizations and that can open up a whole new opportunity um, for more donors who care about your cause because they already care about a cause that's very similar. So thinking about one, who your donor is currently, what they, who they are, where they land, what are their emotional values, what are things that are important to them, figuring out how to accurately and clearly tell your story to try to encourage them to make a gift because it is going to impact them. Uh, these are all things that you can start working on if you haven't yet, uh, or just start working on them in a year round kind of way. Um, and that brings us to the donors that you currently have. So loving those ones that you're already with. Um, you don't want let, to let your most loyal supporters fall through the cracks. Uh, make it a priority for you to connect with them. Um, not just during the giving event. Obviously, a lot of this is for year round fundraising as well. These are just good habits to start to build. Um, but a retained donor is a donor who has already given to you, who cares and wants to keep giving it to you, those are very, very valuable. So kind of trying to make sure you continue to build those relationships, to get them more involved, um, showing gratitude, not just saying, hey, thanks for giving, we're moving on to our next campaign, but maybe having a more personal follow-up, 
um, thanking them throughout the year, maybe getting them involved in, you know, a special newsletter that goes out. So all these different ways that you can elevate your relationships with the donors who you already have is just going to help them, uh, you know, be closer to your organization, care more about it, start talking more to their friends, hopefully open up more doors for your organization. And cared for donors often are willing to give more in the long run, just because you've had such a long, you know, impactful relationship with them. Um, so another thing to think about is moving those donors who, you know, are repeat donors, they're very involved with you, they care about you, you know they're always going to give to you during Richland Gives, moving them into other areas of involvement. So maybe thinking about, hey, how can I get them more involved this year? I know they're going to give us a gift. Uh, maybe I can use that gift to have a matching grant this year. Um, you know, thinking about different ways, maybe they you know, want to be a volunteer with you just for the event. Maybe they're open to helping you make calls or, you know, sealing envelopes and sending them out to donors. So figuring out more ways to get your active loyal supporters more involved with you. Um, peer to peer fundraising obviously is a very, very, you know, great strategy for any giving event. Um, organizations that have peer to peer fundraising always are pretty much going to raise more than those who don't just because you're able to cast a wider net. You're able to have people advocating for you without you needing to constantly be driving home. Uh, we need donations, we need gifts during this hour, that type of thing. So making it easy for people to support you. This is something they can do, you know, remote from their house. They can do it from their phone. Um, there's not a whole lot of time commitment. Uh, easy to get started. If you really want to try peer to peer fundraising, it's often really great to first send out a feeler email, let everybody know this is something you're doing. You can even pop onto Zoom, have everybody who's interested come and attend um, and kind of do like a walkthrough. Here's how you set up a fundraising page. Here's where some resources are available to you. Um, this is the Richland Gives website, you know, breaking it all down makes it really easy and digestible. Uh, it makes it feel less intimidating for those who are new to peer to peer fundraising. Um, and then also using your peer to peer fundraisers as part of your strategy for prizes is really important. Sometimes organizations will, you know, encourage people to peer to peer fundraise, but then it stops as soon as, you know, somebody creates their, their form. As soon as somebody creates their fundraiser, they don't know really how to make it a success for your event. So telling them, hey, we're really trying to do this golden ticket at this hour for most unique donors. This is a great time for you to share your link with your networks, you know, starting at 4 p.m. Uh, to 5 p.m. Like really push it, push on stories, push on, you know, whatever social media you have, send an email to your, whoever is in your network. So letting them know after you create this fundraiser, we're still here to support you. And this is how you can continue supporting us to be the most impactful. Um, this is where I was talking about the fundraiser templates. So you as an admin of your organization, you can access your organization dash dashboard under fundraising tools. Campaigns is where you will find all of your peer-to-peer -peer campaigns. So you'll be able to see who created it. Um, you'll be able to see if an admin created it or if, you know, a peer to peer supporter, someone who's not an admin created it. Um, you can also hide any out of date so you can toggle discoverability. Say you had peer to peer fundraisers last year, they're not relevant this year, you don't want them showing in search. It's a good idea to just hide those so that people aren't donating to them. Um, you can also create a fundraiser template, which is super easy. You have access to one template. Um, you just click create at the top and it prompts you to create um, like a title. So say you want everybody to just have a similar title for this year, they can, you can plug that in, you can plug in a funding goal. Um, and again, donors, uh, not donors, the supporters who are fundraising for you, they can go in and they can obviously update anything on their page. This just helps them not start from a totally empty page. Sarah? Can I yeah. uh, add one thing to peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers? A lot of the peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers that are uh, available in the search need to be updated by you if the peer-to-peer -peer person didn't update it. For example, you know, old totals are showing on your peer-to-peer -peer fundraising page. 
you can go into the dashboard on the left hand side and go into the settings and then reset the date to November 1st, 2023 as the starting date. And that will zero out the metrics for that peer to peer fundraising page. Oops, I was muted. Yes, um, definitely keep that in mind. You can reuse fundraisers from previous years. You don't need to start totally from scratch. So just reset those metrics, update, you know, any 2022 dates or anything that might be, you know, really pressing that needs to be changed. Um, and then you can reuse those fundraisers for this year. Um, another thing we want to talk about is retention. So if you have previously, you know, participated in Richland Gives, then you have access to a retention report. But just in general, you know, fundraising, it's a lot of work. You have a lot of donors who gave during a different campaign. It's something that you want to build into this year's Richland Gives campaign. Um, you can set a retention goal if that's important to you, like how many percent of donors do you want to have retained for this campaign? Um, so kind of thinking about if you have any goals in mind, maybe your goal is to just try to, you know, create a retention plan this year. Um, that's still absolutely wonderful. Um, but coming up with a plan, once a donor gives, how are you going to follow up with them? When are you going to follow up with them? And do you have a long term follow up plan? So if you get a new donor or even if you get somebody who gives again, what is your plan for keeping them up to date, keeping them involved, keeping them close to you so that they continue to feel that connection, to feel inspired to give uh, any time of the year, you know, even Richland Gives 2024, you know, being sure to have a plan in place um, and a plan to try to recapture any donors who haven't given. If you have, uh, you know, a list of 20 donors who gave during last year's Richland Gives and they haven't given uh, by the time the event has come around, what is your plan for how to outreach? Um, are you going to draft up an email? Are you going to, you know, give them a call, send them, obviously you can't send snail mail on the day of the event, but this is a good chance for you to really think through how to take care of these donors so that they do continue get, coming back um, and supporting you. Um, Mighty Cause has a retention report built into the platform for you. So if you've previously participated, you can go to your retention section um, and you can toggle the time period. So you'll type, you'll click uh, Richland Gives 2022, and then you can see quick stats about your retention on the platform from last year's campaign. Um, this is a really great way for you to just quickly pull a list you know, send over an email to anybody who's not retained saying, hey, you gave to our campaign last year. Click here to give again. This is, you know, what our goals are for this year's uh, event. So definitely build that into your strategy, build it into your timeline. Um, also a great option uh, if you, you know, need something for a board member to become helpful in, uh, showing them how they can pull their retention report during the day is a really great task. It's very easy. They can pull that report and then they can send an email uh, or make calls, you know, if you have that donor information as well. Um, but again, don't be afraid to pick up a phone to call your, you know, donors or um, just send a letter, also a good idea. Maybe volunteers or board members post event can start handwriting letters. Honestly, they could start handwriting letters now and just queue them up so that as soon as the event is over, those are in the mail and they're all signed and they all are sending out their appreciation early um, so that you have a quick follow up and plan just to try to, you know, keep that retention level strong. Um, if you find that donors who gave last year aren't giving don't be afraid to make multiple efforts sometimes a single ask gets lost in email it gets lost in spam people are doing a lot of things so don't be afraid to try multiple efforts um, send a you know a couple emails during early giving and then send a couple emails um, during the actual giving event you can also segment your donors um, so if you you know wanted to take this next level you could start to group your donors based on gift size so you can pull a report after the event uh, or just look at last year's event and see, you know, what gift size are you going to start breaking apart? Is it gifts under $20? Receive a certain, uh, you know, email, uh, kind of thinking about how you can make best use of the donor data that you have at your hands. 
Um, and then just keep their giving history and the relationship with your organization at the center. Um, like I said, giving is a very emotional experience. You don't want to just hound people for money. It's really important to get them involved in your cause, you know, sending them handwritten notes, having volunteers uh, make phone calls, um, sending out volunteer opportunities. Maybe somebody has given to you and they didn't even know that there's volunteer opportunities and that's something that they want to try out. Um, so just kind of really thinking about how to keep that donor as a person involved with your organization and not just be thinking about the donations that they they that you'd ideally like them to make to you um, we'll talk a little bit about partnerships because this is something that a lot of organizations um, probably don't make use of but this is very valuable so there's different kinds of partnerships that you can have during uh you know richland gives um, you can think about community partnerships or coalitions with other nonprofits. Um, you can also start to think about sponsors. So we talk about, you know, matching grants. They're a really great way to obviously generate donor excitement. It's a great way for a sponsor to get involved. Um, but it also is a great way um, for sponsors to help in non-monetary ways too. Um, and that means, you know, maybe they're an in-kind sponsor for you. Maybe you have talked to a local print shop and you're, you know, trying to uh, get flyers made or t-shirts made or something and you want to have them be a sponsor for you during Richland Gives, that's something that you can start to think about as well. Sometimes, you know, it costs money to, you know, start advertising and marketing for a giving event. So trying to think about ways that you can get sponsors or partners or community partners kind of working with you, they get the exposure, they get, uh, you know, the full, full of, philanthropic exposure in the community. Um, so those are some things that you can start to think about as well. Also a great job for your board. They can start networking. Maybe they can talk to local, you know, vendors or uh, different organizations to try to see how you all can partner up for the event. Um, sponsorships 101, they are most often businesses and corporations. Um, Obviously, you can have a partnership with a sponsor and it can be year round. Maybe they are, you know, a year round sponsor for you and they do printing for you um, at like a subsidized cost or maybe for free. Who knows? Uh, but the idea is that they receive recognition and they get thanked publicly. Um, you can add their logo, you know, in a small way on different things. It's not advertising for them. It's more acknowledging and recognizing that they have partnered up with you and that they care about your cause. Um, and the goal is basically to increase revenue. They, you know, get exposure uh, by, you know, being on your different mailers and stuff like that. And then the goal is for them to also advocate for you um and to talk about your organization because they obviously care about it enough to sponsor you so ideally that's leading to you know new donors new connections um and stuff like that uh, but like i said it can be monetary they can offer you you know you know funding for a grant um for a you know, match during richland gives or it can be non-monetary which is in kind like i was talking about the t-shirt example or the free printing services um, or stuff like that. Um, recurring giving is also a really great strategy uh, because this is looking more towards the long, long haul, you know, long yearly kind of view of how Richland Gives works into your campaign. Um, obviously, recurring giving is becoming more popular, especially with younger donors. Um, recurring giving is really great, especially in small sizes. So you can do, you know, those $10 donations and you can encourage people and talk about how impactful it is to set up a recurring gift during Richland Gives. So when the donor is checking out, they have the option on your own donation form to select one-time gift or recurring gift. So perhaps part of your strategy this year is to have a goal to get, you know, X number of recurring gifts set up during Richland Gives. Uh, it's just becoming a very popular charitable giving model, like I said, especially younger donor, donors, millennials. It's like a subscription to a cause that they care about. It's very popular. So kind of leaning into that beginning slide where we talked about, you know, the emotional connection with the donor, letting them know 
hey, by doing a recurring gift for $10 every month, this is what we're able to achieve. And here's how that impacts you. Um, it also allows them to give, you know, at the end of the year, they've given a larger gift amount, but they've broken it up into smaller gifts. So that's one really great strategy to try to work in this year that maybe is new for you. Um, kind of framing that message, you know, here's what, uh, obviously my math is not very good, but here's what, you know, 12, you know, $500 does at the end of the year. And here's how that can look for you broken up over, you know, 12 months, starting with Richland Gives, make your gift. And, you know, you're, you're probably all better at marketing than what I'm doing on the fly, but that's kind of the idea. It's a really great strategy. And then you can look forward to, you know, counting on those recurring gifts each month instead of just trying to advocate for one gift on one day. Um, how to increase recurring giving. Um, you can update your external website. So maybe you use a different website year round for Richland Gives. Um, but during the actual giving event, you can set up um, like a, um, a widget is what we call it on the dashboard and you can swap in our donate button on Richling Gives for your donate button on your external website. That, that means that when the donor goes to click donate on a website that's not Richling Gives and they click this button, those donations are going to be attached to your actual organization page for Richling Gives, um, which is really helpful because you're able to, one, capture any donors who might not be familiar or remembering that they need to donate on your actual Richland Gives organization page for prizes to count. Um, so that's a good way to do that. You can also set up recurring giving. Um, you can also update suggested donation amounts. Uh, it's just a very useful tool. So think about adding the widget to your um, any external websites. Um, and you can also kind of think about creating a recurring giving program as part of your strategy. So thinking about a special package, um, maybe they get a special newsletter when they set up um, a recurring gift, like, you know, here we are getting into marketing on the fly, but maybe you have a special newsletter that's created that is all about impacts for recurring giving. Um, because the goal is to also keep them as a recurring giver and not have them hopefully, you know, they're not setting up a recurring gift and then canceling it. So you wanna make sure they know your recurring gift is so important and here's what it's doing. Um, and then just keeping recurring donors engaged. So asking for their opinions, maybe sending out surveys, maybe you do, not everyone likes a phone call, so feel it out, but maybe you do phone calls, maybe you do Zoom meetings quarterly for recurring givers, maybe it's like a mixer. Um, you can give them shout outs if they're into that. Um, they can be featured in a newsletter. I'm sure you all have kind of seen uh, other, you know, sites and things that do uh, like kind of like a sponsor. It's like thanks to our recurring givers. So you can itemize and list out those names. Um, donor of the month, you all can kind of think about what actually would work with your organization. Uh, but in-person events might be fun. You could do, um, you know, if you have a goal for recurring donors this year, and you're starting that kind of campaign. Uh, maybe next year before Richling Gives, you have a mixer for your recurring donors so that you can kind of, you know, make them feel special because recurring giving is just so impactful. It's so important. It's money you can count on each month of the year. Um, and then just keep notes on your interactions. See what people like. Are people, you know, vibing with in-person events? Maybe not. Maybe they are. Maybe you want to host more of them. Um, and just keep your goals in mind as well. So if you want, you know, start small if recurring giving is new to you, maybe you only wanna get five or 10 recurring gifts during Richling Gives, but this is all kind of a good thing to start thinking about uh, as far as strategy. Um, and we are getting close on time, so I wanna make sure we have time for Q&A, but I believe these are our last few slides. So board involvement is also just so, so important as you're looking towards your Richling Gives campaign. Um, they can be so involved, uh, Maybe they're looking for ways to get involved. Maybe they don't know what you need from them. They don't know truly how to support you. So education is just going to be so key. Um, 
usually it's the lack of education. They don't understand the programs. They don't understand, you know, how they can help. So that's what's making them unable to try to help you fundraise. So come up with a time to meet, come up with a timeline of different things that you're working on for your campaign. When do you need all your emails, you know, queued up and drafted? Is that something that a board member could help you with? Could they help you with drafting up email messaging or creating marketing materials or creating, helping think of like a theme for this year's campaign, um, thinking about different ways that they can get involved and just being very specific with your ask. Maybe you would like them to try to get, you know, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising pages set up or a team fundraiser for the board. Um, maybe that's something that they can help with and then they can share their board member uh, fundraisers to try to get more gifts, to try to spread the word, advertise. Maybe you want the board to help you, you know, set up or uh, solicit for matches this year um, or those community uh, partnerships that we were talking about earlier. There's all different ways for boards to get involved, but they usually do need to be told specifically what you need from them and then how they can help achieve, um, like, you know, your goals. Um, just as I was saying, I get ahead of myself usually in the slides, but you can create a template for them. You could have a board member create the template. Um, you can get them involved in, you know, setting up these events for your large donors. Um, so you just want to set expectations early on so that they have time to ask questions, um, so that they have a specific role uh, that they know that they're helping you with. Maybe they're helping you with specific marketing for the event. Maybe they're answering all social media comments and questions and, and stuff during the, you know, the seven to seven day event. Um, and maybe you have a couple who are, you know, pre-writing thank you notes so that you have a hand, hand, uh, kind of a handwritten thank you takeaway that you can mail to each of your donors. So there's all different kind of buckets of help that they can you know, support you with. It's just a matter of trying to get them uh, understanding how to do each of those. Um, and then last but not least, board members as donors, they obviously have a responsibility to contribute to your nonprofit financially. Often boards have dues. This is what uh, Mara and I were talking early on about how board members could come together to give you a match. Um, maybe they have, you know, each want to donate $100 so that you have a $1,000 match for the event. That's an easy way to get them involved. And then that gives them a talking point. They can advertise the match. They can say, we have this match. Uh, it's, you know, available X time to X time. So there's all these different pieces that start to come together. Um, and just making sure you communicate that to your board is going to be so, so helpful for you. Um, and then our resources and support. Uh, you all probably have seen it by now. The nonprofit toolkit on the Richland Gives um, site. It's updated this year. Looks a little different. Um, but you have your toolkit assets, um, your platform basics. Different. Uh, the webinars will be uploaded. Um, and then of course, Mighty Cause. Uh, the actual platform also has a ton of support articles for you if you need to figure out how to create that fundraiser template. Um, or if you just want, you know, fundraising support, stuff like that. We have a lot of blog posts. We have pre-recorded webinars. I believe we have a webinar all about matches. So if you wanted to dig into that, you could as well. Alrighty. Well, thank you everyone um, for attending. I will put the recording up in the toolkit um, along with the slide deck. If you have any questions, just feel free to reach out.